Welcome to the Gay Buddhist Forum, where teachers from all schools of Buddhism offer their perspectives on the Dharma and its application in modern times, especially for LGBTQI audiences. These talks are offered freely to the world and made possible by appreciative listeners. If you would like to support our efforts to share the Dharma with underserved audiences, please visit gaybuddhist.org. There you can donate, find a list of upcoming speakers, or enjoy many hundreds of these recorded talks dating back to 1996. Welcome back to the Gay Buddhist Fellowship. Um, <coughs> our tradition is to go around and introduce ourselves by first names, and then I'll introduce our speaker. And again, just by a show of hands, anybody here first time or after a long absence? We'll try and remember. We'll try and remember your names as we go around, make you feel welcome during our social period. Um, our guest, I will introduce after. <laughs> 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 I'm Tom. Rich. Prasada Chitta. Michael. I'm Greg. Juan. Matt. I'm Zed. Jeff. I'm Roy. My name is Jerry. I'm David. <coughs> My name is Clint. Francesco. Matthew. Larry. Dennis. Tony. My name is Cass. I'm Jack. Samuel. <coughs> Peter. My name is David. Grisha. Ivan. I'm Hal. I'm Jim. My name is Richard. George. I'm Tim. One. Jay. Great. Um, and then our speaker is Bill Scheinman. Uh, Bill has been teaching mindfulness since 2001 and leads corporate mindfulness workshops throughout the Bay Area, as well as classes in mindfulness-based stress reduction. He is a graduate of Spirit Rock's Community Dharma Leaders Program and is a former president of the board of the San Francisco Insight Meditation Community. He is the author of the Mindfulness Guide, Moment by Moment, and he blogs about mindfulness and dharma on his website, stressreductionatwork.com. Bill, welcome back. Thank you, Tom. Really good to be here. Um, and another thing you could have added uh, to that bio, uh, I appreciate the last minute of editing, too, because it's what's weird with bios is that you're not really... They live on forever. <laughs> you know, your situation is always changing, and the bio is a static thing, and sometimes it's just not, oh, that's actually not... Um, the right thing to say about myself. But one thing you could have added to the bio is that um, I started my practice 23 years ago in this room. And uh, so I have quite a history with this space and the building above and um, yeah, it's quite an amazing thing. So it's really uh, wonderful to be here today. And <clears throat> So what I've prepared is I've got some sort of a talk, uh, kind of a talk, kind of just uh, talking points, uh, some things that I jotted down that I'll probably uh, read from and riff off of. And what I'm calling the talk is the importance of truth in an age of alternative facts. <laughs> and... Uh, you know, it's an interesting topic because uh, yesterday there was uh, something called the March for Truth, right? It was all over the country and in the world as well. And so the truth is something that's on a lot of people's minds these days. And I don't pretend to have the answers to what the truth is. Uh, I'm just going to basically explore this and uh, throw it out there and uh, talk for a while. And then I'm hoping... Um, that we can do a little inquiry and exploration ourselves uh, in a discussion at the end. We'll see how long, uh, I'm not sure how long I'm going to be talking for, so um, we'll figure it out. So I think of this talk as a, an exploration and also a starting point. And uh, there's a famous expression, and I'm sure uh, everyone here knows, uh, the truth will set you free. And uh, it's a beautiful expression um, attributed to uh, Jesus Christ. And um, it's actually kind of 
amazing thing because it's very much in alignment with the Dharma. The Dharma is all about um, realizing the truth. In fact, the term Dharma has different meanings. Uh, it's often referred to as the teachings of the Buddha, uh, also um, phenomena, experience of phenomena that arises, uh, comes and goes. That's also, those are known as dharmas. But another um, definition for the word dharma is uh, universal law or the truth of the way things are. So really dharma practice is learning how to align ourselves with truth <clears throat> and experiencing awakening to that truth uh, in ever, ever more deep ways. So here's a quote from the Buddha about, uh, he's pointing to the importance of truth in relationship to lying, uh, to, to what's not true. And I want to be careful about using the word lying because I'm actually going to be looking at truth in relationship to what's not true, but also in relationship to when we avoid truth because we practice truth or we embody truth and then there are times when we avoid it. So in a sense, that's kind of, kind of along the same lines. But I don't want to, I don't want to use the word lying lightly. But uh, the Buddha says, the person who lies, who transgresses in this one thing, transcending concern for the world beyond, there's no evil he might not do. So the idea is that when we're, you know, when we tell falsehoods or when we don't live truthfully, it's like we're, we're kind of derailed in a way. And that's even true, my understanding is um, from this teaching is that's even true for little lies that we might tell ourselves or tell others. <clears throat> so the idea is that if living in, in the, uh, an alignment with truth is what helps us awaken, then um, worshiping or following what isn't true is going to lead us into suffering, into untruth, unawakening, unconsciousness. And so I have, I've actually found this to be very true in my own life. Uh, and I'll, I'll share some stories from my own life um, as well. So you have these two poles. It's interesting to look at these two poles from the perspective of, the, 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 on the one hand, you have living in alignment with truth. On the other hand, avoiding truth or um, following falsehood. And it's interesting to look at those polls in, uh, through the lens of American politics and culture right now. And, um, and I'm not, that's not to suggest that um, worshiping falsehood began with Donald Trump. <laughs> because I think we all, we all do it in some ways. And one of the things that I'm interested about is taking the idea of um, kind of society's way of looking at truths uh, and actually um, the relationship of our government kind of on a macro level to truth that takes one form, but then our own relationship to truth in our own lives in each moment, that also takes a certain form. And I, and I think they're completely related. Um, so that's one thing I'd like to kind of explore a little bit. And so, you know, for me, it's um, realizing truth or... Uh, living, embodying, trying to embody truth is not only important um, for our Dharma practice and for realization of wisdom in our lives, but it's critically important for having a more just society and world, uh, for justice, 
uh, social justice, for uh, overcoming disparities, overcoming hatred, racism, uh, and all the isms that divide us. Really, really important to live in alignment with truth, with facts. And, um, you know, I've been thinking about this a lot, and I'll share some of the ways that I've been doing that, but thinking about this a lot since the election. And um, it's pretty obvious to me that we're living really in dangerous times. We're living in a world of alternative facts in which science is ignored and statistical information is removed from official websites, a world in which propaganda and fake news is weaponized in our politics to affect the outcome of elections and to and successfully affecting the outcome of elections. A world where real news, which is really just supposed to be the reporting of facts, that's what real news is supposed to be, is actually denied or demeaned as false by those in power. So in a government where people, you know, officials get to have their own facts, where reality becomes subjectively curated, where there's no consensus about truth, that's a government that is really heading towards authoritarianism. And in fact, um, you can't have authoritarian. You can't have authoritarianism unless if truth is respected. You can't have the rule of law um, if truth is not respected. You can't have democracy if truth is not respected. So, collectively, and I, I guess I don't need to say, tell you this, but we have our work cut out for us collectively. And even before the election, we had our work cut out for us, but now we really have our work cut out for us. And I also want to just say something. I don't think of what I'm saying as a partisan thing at all. This is not about left or right. This is really about something more fundamental, which is uh, li literally living in alignment with facts. So I think, uh, again, this happens on a big level, a macro level, also happens on an individual level. And I'll give you an example in my own life of um, where I was not living in alignment with truth and just what I noticed about that. So I have um, gray hair. Uh, I just got it cut yesterday. And uh, so I don't have a lot of it, but it is gray. And uh, for many years, a number of years, when my, my hair first became gray, uh, I had this kind of salt and pepper thing happening, uh, which was good. And then it kept getting gray, more and more gray, more and more gray, and it was all salt, basically. <laughs> a little bit of pepper, but mostly salt. And I resisted that change in my body and in how I was presenting. And I resisted it by doing something called Clairol for men. <laughs> and, um, and I thought it was great. You know, I was like, oh, this is fantastic. You know, I'm, this is who I want to look like. And um, my friends told me it was great. You know, they said, oh, it looks great, Bill. And, um, and one day, w the woman I was uh, with at the time said to me, you know, your hair looks kind of a phony. It, it doesn't look good. You can kind of tell. And I said to her, I said, what? It looks great. It looks fantastic. What are you talking about? I said, my friends tell me it looks great. And she said, they're lying. They're just trying to make you feel good. And I realized, I realized that, um, that she was right. And um, and so I, I want to be careful here. I have nothing against dyeing your hair, any color. It's totally good. But what I realized for me is that there was a certain tension that I was experiencing because I wasn't able to be with the truth 
of my aging as that was showing up in my gray hair. And at a, and I, I let go of Clairol for men. I said, screw it. I'm just going to let myself go gray. And um, a certain amount of suffering and tension released in me because I was willing to be with that truth. And I think there are thousands of ways in which we experience our lives when, when we're not actually able to be with what it is that's here and we do something to distract ourselves or to create another image. And I think that's an interesting, interesting thing for us just to look at um, individually. Like what ways do I hide from the truth and what ways do I do that? And, and what's the effect that that has on me? Um, another story... It was uh, literally about two months before I came to the center and began my Dharma practice. I had been uh, basically in therapy for many years, and this is like February or January or February 1994. I confronted my mother about some issues from my childhood, and it was a really painful conversation and in that conversation she was open to hearing my point of view and and she took responsibility for where she needed to and we were having a dialogue it was quite beautiful it was really painful it was like it's the kind of conversation I needed to have with her for many years and I finally was able to have this conversation with her and I phone call ended and I felt well this is great something has begun now some truth is being told now in a way that I hadn't been telling it before and a week later I had a, fun, a conversation with my mom and she was completely denying everything that had happened the week before in our conversation <laughs> she just shut down it was too much for her she didn't she retreated back into unconsciousness. And um, she took that unconsciousness with her um, to her, her death. So, you know, and that caused me a little suffering, but what was really important about that is that I told the truth uh, when I needed to. Then there's the, uh, the difficult relationship with truth uh, that can exist in our social spheres and in our work spheres. Um, and so that kind of brings us to the world of business. And I want to share something about the business world, my connection to the <coughs> business world, because I'm basically not a... Um, I don't think of my, I really don't come from the business world. My connection to the business world is because I was practicing the Dharma for many years and I began practicing as a volunteer in the San Francisco County Jail for many years and I felt like it would be a useful thing to bring to businesses and so I began teaching in businesses and corporations. And the, so the business world that I'm most familiar with is this thing called secular mindfulness. Is this a familiar term for mo anyone not familiar with this term? Secular mindfulness. So what it, it, what it really is, is it's taking Dharma teachings, especially the teachings of mindfulness, and taking all the Buddhism, the Buddhist rhetoric out of them and bringing them into a corporate setting in, in a way where it's more mainstream and applied. That's a, that's a thumbnail of what secular mindfulness is. And I've been doing this, engaged in the secular mindfulness world for 10 years. Um, actually, I'm in my 11th year now. And one of the, <clears throat> one of the things, one of the uh, uh, annual events that happens every year that is really a, kind of a convention of secular mindfulness 
is an event called Wisdom 2.0. Uh, anyone been to Wisdom 2.0 here? It's interesting. So I, you know, it's, it's funny because I've been like a big secular mindfulness person. I've worked in this sphere a lot. And uh, Wisdom 2.0 has been happening for nine years in San Francisco for nine straight years. And I had never done it, ever, until this year. I finally went to Wisdom 2.0. And I met a lot of people, saw a lot of panels, a lot of discussions, and a lot of great people, really nice folks. And, um, but a lot of those folks at Wisdom 2.0, what, why they're there is because they've got an angle on mindfulness. <laughs> they have an angle. And the angle is about making money. So it's really about um, leveraging what they learn um, in whatever field they're in to figure out a way of creating a livelihood from mindfulness. And, you know, having an angle on mindfulness is not in, in itself a problem, but what ends up happening is it becomes this this kind of momentum where everybody starts doing it and everybody is looking for their angle. And so when the angle becomes about making money, what you end up creating is a version of mindfulness without ethics and wisdom. And when mindfulness becomes uh, selectively edited and repurposed as simply a new management tool for achieving a better bottom line, something very profound gets lost. And that's really the danger in secular mindfulness, which I have participated in and have also resisted. So an analogy, uh, I had, had this idea of an analogy. Uh, I saw this somewhere. It was in some DIY uh, or, uh, uh, magazine. You take a refrigerator and a refrigerator has been great at refrigerating food for years and years and years. And then you end up getting a new refrigerator and you take the old refrigerator and instead of throwing it out, you repurpose it. You put it in your garage and it becomes a storage cabinet. Okay? Which is great. N nothing wrong with that. But, um, but the, when it's a storage cabinet, its ability for refrigeration, which is really why it was there, uh, is no longer, it's no longer connected to that ability. And mindfulness, <coughs> what mindfulness is about is liberation, actually. It's about freedom. And so when it becomes about making money or it becomes about uh, you know, the greatest, newest management tool, it loses that connection to liberation. And that, that's, the, that's the, what I've seen anyway. So um, I want to uh, share a couple of anecdotes about this whole corporate <laughs> mindfulness world. To just, I think it's really useful to know what's, how mindfulness, the term mindfulness, is being framed mm -hmm. out there in the corporate world and, and what's happening because I've been in those trenches for a number of years, especially in the last two years, quite a lot of it. And I've rubbed elbows with a lot of folks in the corporate world who are teaching mindfulness. And what I've seen is I've seen um, people who have only been practicing for three months, who have never been on a silent retreat or done any intensive practice, who are now being held up as mindfulness thought leaders, <laughs> experts in mindfulness. Why? Because they're marketed that way by the companies they're, that they're with. And it's really easy how it can happen. You know, you basically um, summarize some research on, on LinkedIn. You write an article on LinkedIn summarizing someone else's study, and voila, you're a thought leader. Or you get a title 
uh, job title called Chief Mindfulness Officer. <laughs> and you're laughing, and it is funny, but believe it or not, that is an actual title, CMO. And it's actually in a number, a number of corporations have that now, Chief Mindfulness Officer. So this is, and, and what's happening is, so um, the whole field of mindfulness as a thing that happens in mainstream culture, in corporations, uh, where, where, by the way, all the money is in terms of making this a livelihood, that's really being taken over by uh, organizational psychologists or consultants, human resources folks, um, uh, management gurus. These are the folks who are taking it over. Um, and many of them are not that experienced with mindfulness, with, with the potential for mindfulness. And this is just a reality. So, and I, I want to be careful here because there's a lot of good that's being done also by these people. Um, but there's this, this way mindfulness is being packaged where the corporate world has a uh, relationship to mindfulness which is not entirely truthful. It's not really based in what mindfulness is on certain levels. A lot of it is about developing uh, concentration and focus, not so much about wisdom, not so much about compassion, not so much about ethics. Uh, for example, in a corporate mindfulness class, um, you'll never hear a facilitator say anything about sexual misconduct. <laughs> <laughs> you just you know, that will will not happen in a corporate mindfulness class. You you just won't get certain th subjects. Everything is kind of again, it's it's kind of mindfulness is curated for this environment, and some of that can be very skillful, but when it's done at a certain shallow uh, shallow level, it you really lose that connection with the truth. So I wanted to share this because I'm talking about the truth. I wanted to share this. Uh, my own personal experience as a, a corporate mindfulness trainer, and I've seen a lot of good done in those settings, but I've also I've also got a lot of concerns uh, about the way mindfulness is being held. So we can get really granular in, in ways that we're not in alignment with the truth. And the most granular is just looking at our own, the way we are in our everyday lives, in our everyday moments. And one way that I think we routinely avoid the truth um, is in this, uh, this idea of presence, being present for life, for reality. And I think this is like the most basic way that we don't live in alignment with, with what's here. So for example, um, being so preoccupied by your phone uh, or the thoughts in your head that you walk down a flight of stairs and you're completely not aware of any of the steps you took or you open a door and you're completely not aware of it or you're sitting on a bus or walking down the street or eating a sandwich or having a conversation and there's just all this other stuff happening you're not being present so in a way we're not being here for what's true very routine moments where we're not in alignment with what's here um, another example and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pivot to social media um, has so anyone had the experience of like going to an event and you're just totally focused, so focused on getting a photograph of you with a certain group of people or at a certain place and posting it on Facebook or wherever that you're actually, you weren't that present at the event? Is this something, anyone ever experienced that? I'll be honest. <laughs> I'll be honest too. Absolutely. Um, you know, sometimes it's just we just get so preoccupied with it. Um, one example that I've really felt for me is um, after the election, I got 
I basically had a nervous breakdown after the election, okay? And I mean, you know, I'm, I'm a liberal, progressive, you know, East Bay person, and I, I kind of really got freaked out, and my nervous system got very aroused. And frankly, it's still aroused. It's like still very, very aroused. And that's not necessarily good. <laughs> Because one of the things that I discovered in somewhere around January or so is Twitter. <laughs> and I started following all of these people who were, you know, you know, in, you know, interested in investigating the president and other people. And, uh, and I started really following that. And I'm still doing this, following this. But one of the problems with that is that it's continued to arouse my nervous system in ways that maybe aren't very helpful. So I'm being totally honest here. And so what, that, what that's about is sometimes we, the social media robs us or coaxes us, coaxes us out of being present. And when that happens, we're not here for, for life, for reality. Now don't get me wrong, I love social media. I think it's an absolutely fantastic thing. It's changing the world. And it's, it has the potential, and it already is changing the world in profound ways that has to do with making places in the planet more connected and more conscious of what's going on. I think it's really important. But we can hold it and in such a way. And, of course, it's also true that when we use social media, there's an addictive... Uh, a brain chemical, uh, dopamine, that gets triggered in the brain that where we actually experience a, an addiction, an addictive rush, so that the more we use social media, the more we get this little dopamine coming in. And so that actually, it, it's a self-fulfilling thing. We just end up getting addicted to it. But because of that, we lose our presence. So really the key thing is, is it trying to cultivate some balance with this wonderful tool, which can, if we do it excessively, coax us out of, coax, uh, you know, you know, uh, forces us out of presence. So, um, you know, um, you could make an argument that what I'm talking about is kind of like there's, these are big truths, alternative facts that we're getting from the government. And then there are the ways that we avoid the truth when we're walking down a staircase. And that it's really different things, very, very different. And that, that, that's valid. But I'm convinced that if everyone in the world could simply open a door with complete presence, we'd have a completely transformed world if everyone could just be completely present and doing a really simple thing, have a totally different world. So I'm, I feel that being in alignment with what's here, the truth, presence, is actually, um, it's, it's micro and it's macro. It affects everything. So I want to talk about resisting untruth or resisting alternative facts or resisting the ways that we enchant ourselves or mesmerize ourselves with our own thoughts and our own fantasies in a way that uh, we lose being present. How do we resist? Well, there are two basic ways that I see resistance happening. The first is on a macro level. Um, there's some great resistance happening right now. Collectively, there's a lot of resistance. There was the March for Truth yeah. yesterday. There was, uh, there was uh, you know, marches all over happening. Um, the ACLU is filing lawsuits. Judges are standing up for constitutional principles. Uh, there are all sorts of things that are happening that are, it's really people are valuing the truth and they're standing up for it and it's very, very inspiring to me to see it. Again, on Twitter, I'm connected with people I never thought I'd be connected to. 
like you know former CIA agents or national security officials. You know, it's like, and I'm following them on Twitter. What in what universe did I ever think I'd be connected to those folks on Twitter? But it's really and and all people from all political persuasions. And it's really all about everyone is interested in the truth. They're interested in the truth. And on a personal level, the way we resist this untruth or this avoidance of truth is through practice. We, we practice, we do our practice, our daily practice. Uh, we go on intensive retreats if we're able to do that. We practice ethics. We study the Dharma. You know, sometimes we do these practices and um, we don't necessarily know what effect they're having on our lives unless something big happens. And I had an illustration of this a few years ago. In uh, 2013, my mother passed away. And I got a phone call from my brother, and he said, the hospice nurse says she's only got a few days. She just became unresponsive. And so I hung, you know, I ended the phone call. I made, I settled my affairs. I got a flight. I went on the flight the next day. I sat with my mother for four days, and I also worked with my brother. We did things like we you know, picked out a casket, uh, flowers, uh, services. And, and, and for that, that entire five or six day period, from the moment I put that phone down to the, after my mother passed, I never anticipated the next moment. I didn't anticipate the next moment at all. It just didn't happen. I was completely present for this experience in my life, which was a really big experience, saying goodbye to my mother. <clears throat> and that's when I knew, oh my God, this is my practice. My practice is holding me. It's allowing me to be present right now. And so, um, just to conclude, um, and then we'll do a little inquiry in a moment. Waking up with the truth, aligning yourself with the truth, is not something that you do on Monday, and then you can forget about it for the rest of the week. Because as far as I know, I don't know anyone who is completely awakened. Um, I'm a work in progress. <laughs> And um, everyone I know is a work in progress, so we have to keep waking up. And waking up is, a, is an intention that we have. And the bad news is we will fail again and again and again. And the good news is we will fail again and again and again because it means we're getting right back on it. We're remembering to come back when we can. And um, so those are my thoughts about truth from a macro level, political level, to more an individual level. And I thought what we could do is actually, um, I think what we're going to do is, because we're running a little tight on time, is I'm going to lead you guys in a reflection and then we'll open it up for a discussion. Does that sound good? Okay, so I'd like to just invite you to you know, sit comfortably. You don't need to take any particular posture. Uh, if you'd like to close your eyes, you can do that. I'm just taking a moment to reconnect with the body as it sits and breathes. And so I'd just like to invite you to reflect on two questions. And the first question is, 
in what areas do you see yourself avoiding the truth and how has that affected you? And when I say avoiding the truth, it could be on any level. It could be something that's happening politically or so, uh, or economically or in the world, environmentally, or it could be something personally. In what areas do you see yourself avoiding the truth and how has that affected you? And the second question to reflect on is, what would change if you aligned yourself more closely with that truth? So uh, just coming out of the reflection, uh, we have a few minutes to have a discussion. Um, I don't have a closing poem. I, I often do, but I don't today. So um, those are my thoughts on the truth, uh, something that I've just been thinking about. And I'm uh, interested to hear from you any thoughts that you might have on anything that I shared or anything that uh, occurred to you uh, during the talk. Anyone, please. Um, I want to say I really loved your talk. It was really, it was very relevant. Thank you. And um, I really appreciated your not being cheerful to be truthful about our current political situation. I feel like sometimes um, it just made me think actually about a conversation I was having with some friends yesterday on Bart, and one of them's a therapist, and he's telling all his patients to like stop reading the news and for I guess for their well being but he's also kind of a person who generally tends to avoid what's going on in politics. And I was just kind of thinking about that and like how it relates like balance, like you know, being truthful and honest about what's happening in our world today, but also not, you know, overly dwelling on it to the point where it disrupts your life and then creates yeah. some help. Um and also I I found it very useful just to kind of bring that to like a more personal level um, because it did make me reflect on you know how it's not just this lack of truth that's in our current leadership but it's also you know we all do this all the time and I was just thinking about you know especially the last things you said that really you know, like how when I'm dishonest with myself about any particular thing you know whether it be money or time or some problem I'm avoiding. It's just, it never, you never fare well, you know, it just, it's uh -huh. just, it just never, I've never, and I, and it's, you know, it's just you never fare well, that's what's going on right now in our, in our, you know, greater world. It's like, we're yeah. not going to fare well from any of these things that are happening. There are definitely consequences to everything. Definitely, definitely. And there's also positive consequences when you do face them. Uh huh. You know? So yeah. yeah, it was really it was a great talk. Thank you, hey, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, you know we all we all indulge in alternative facts. You know, on some level, I mean, when when I needed to have black hair, <laughs> that was my alternative fact. <laughs> you know, so it is the macro and the micro. It's all connected. Thank you. Who else, please? Um. <clears throat> The truth is interesting to me. It, it's it's um, you know there's truth and there's not truth, but it's it's not so easy to know what's true. Um, you know, we talked about how hard it is to know what's true about yourself, mm -hmm. and then we have ideas of what's true in the macro environment. Mm -hmm. you know, when I talk to certain people that um, do not share the same belief in the truth I think is true, it's not like they're trying to um, deceive people. Um, they seem to believe 
that they have a truth that's different than my truth. So the question is, how do we determine what's true? Well, so it's a great question. And I think what I was talking about was uh, the types of truths that are <clears throat> very gross, like there are facts that, you know, for example, global warming um, is pretty fact-based at this point, but there are some people who think it's a hoax. Um, so I'm kind of talking as, as if, and, and I'm, I'm a, uh, you know, my assumption is that global warming is not a hoax. So, and then also contrasting that with the smaller ways or the more personal individual ways that we're not in alignment with the truth. And I think what you're speaking to is something that's also a very big part of this, which is the ambiguity and the uncertainty, uh, the complexity of reality. I mean, things are often very unclear, and a lot of times we don't know what's true. And then when that's the case, we have to learn how to practice with not knowing mind. But if, if you know that something is true factually, uh, that doesn't mean that you have to stop believing it just because someone else has another belief. Um, because I, I don't think people are trying to be bad people if, if they don't believe something that I don't think is factually true, but it's still factually true. Is that... didn't exactly address yeah, what, I, you're I see what you're saying? I see what you're saying, but it's even... You know, even what we call facts... There's a difference of, a, of opinion, um, and it's not so, it's not so black and white. There's differences of emphasis. There's well, and there's sorts of there's also different ethics too. Different ethical principles. People have different traditions or a different sense of ethics. So what may be really not good for one person is really great for someone else. And so there's that's definitely an ambiguous situation for sure. Definitely, and it's 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 hard to be with that. Is 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 there anything within that ambiguity that you wanted to share, or just that 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 difficulty determining the truth? Well, um, you know, it's interesting. I turn I, I turn on Fox News sometime to kind of see the other side. Yeah, and it, it doesn't seem to me like it's it's. Um, it's so black and white. That's what's true and what's not true. But they did, they have a different emphasis. They pick the, the, the stories and parts of reality because they've got an underlying agenda. The way I feel like an MSNBC has a, an underlying right. agenda. Right. Definitely. So it's hard to, you know. And so part part of the truth. Is, is knowing that people have agendas and that, and that the way they're expressing truth has an agenda and that in itself becomes part of understanding the truth right. because people, people have an agenda MSNBC, Fox News, very, very different, you're right and it's not like everything on Fox News is bad for me, I mean as a, as a lefty you know, at, or everything on MSNBC is great either it's, but it's just knowing that um, knowing what you're getting and that everyone has a different perspective. That's part of the truth, understanding truth, is, is the ambiguity of it. Thank you. Thank you. You mentioned something I think you called not knowing mind. Yeah. Does that mean like just being able to accept that you don't know what's what and you just sort of let it be? So, to a certain extent, not knowing mind is, uh, it's often in Zen, it's called beginner's mind. Uh -huh. So it's being in the state of being open to what's here. A lot of times we don't know what's here, and a lot of times when we think we know what's here, we're preventing ourselves from actually seeing what's here, because we have our own, uh, we have our own template of reality that we're putting on things. And so not knowing mind is actually, for some people, a very difficult place to be in because we want clarity. Mm -hmm. And so it can, it can be a real practice to let yourself not know, to be comfortable with not knowing, mm -hmm. uh, because then you start to learn amazing things that you didn't even think you could learn. So yeah. That's one of the main things in intercultural communication is to just 
get comfortable with ambiguity and not having the answer or knowing what's going on and just being open to the experience. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. And uh, getting comfortable with ambiguity is really, really important for sure. Thank you. Bill, thank you so much. I think that's all we have time for. But, you know, I really appreciated your addressing head on this, the, the pitfalls of um, secular mindfulness. Because when you started talking about it, I'm like, I hope he's going to, you know, address this. And uh, so it was very interesting <laughs> seeing you go at that head on. I very much appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much. It's something I've been thinking about a lot. Thank you. For thank you so much. Um, next week, our speaker will be Dorothy Hunt. Uh, she'll be returning to us. In fact, she, the, uh, her last talk with us was the subject of this month's or this quarter's um, newsletter. So you can uh, expect to see her back. She is the um, spiritual director of Moon Mountain Sangha, and she has practiced psychotherapy since 1967. She's the founder of the San Francisco Center for Meditation and Psychotherapy, and um, you can read more about her in the newsletter as well. Um, our sangha is supported by your generosity, um, your dana, and giving. So um, we have a dana bowl. We uh, our suggested donation is eight to ten dollars. That helps us do everything from rent this space to put out our newsletter. Over half of which go to people who are incarcerated. Um, a number of other things that we do, including a monthly uh, dinner that we do for the uh, runaway youth and homeless at Larkin Street Youth Center, and um, other things that go on our website, our all that stuff. Do you, were you raising your hand? Okay. No, no, I'm just listening intently. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, our host today is Richard. Richard. Yes, Our Lady of the Bowl is your host today. Um, <laughs> so there are some cookies and strawberries and dates out there to enjoy. Uh, we have hot water for tea. If you just put your cup in the dishwasher when you're done. There's a sign-up sheet on the credenza here. And uh, some people go out to lunch around 12.30 usually meet by the door. Um, I think it's something. So enjoy. Yeah, and um, you know, trying to say hello to uh, Samuel and Yvonne um, during our social period. Uh, any other announcements? Okay, let's gather in a circle for our dedication of merit. <laughs> By the power and truth of this practice, may all beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all be free from sorrow and the causes of sorrow. May all never be separated from the sacred happiness which is without sorrow. And may all live in equanimity without too much attachment or too much aversion, believing in the equality of all that lives. Thank you for listening to the Gay Buddhist Forum. If you would like to hear several new talks per month and be notified of upcoming speakers so you can participate live, please subscribe to this podcast, like us on Facebook, and join our mailing list by visiting gaybuddhist.org. <laughs>